Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, uh, happy Monday to you. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Lance Cleland. I'm the director of the Tin House Writers Workshop, and you're uh, coming uh, to us on the last day of our 2021 Winter Workshop. Uh, so happy that you can be here today um, on this holiday. Uh, before we begin, we mentioned this a little bit earlier today at some of our uh, lectures, but we do want to uh, acknowledge um, Martin Luther King Day that we're um, it's taking place today. And uh, one of the ways that we were, we talked about earlier that we could be of service today is uh, especially within the literary community is supporting black owned bookstores. So for those of you joining on YouTube, uh, we dropped some links in there um, where you can find a, a black owned bookstore uh, in your vicinity or uh, anywhere around the country. And one that we wanted to particularly highlight was Loyalty Bookstore in DC. Um, they had to close their um, shop up um, their online is still open, but their actual physical locations because of the white supremacist led insurrection that uh, is taking place and the threat of more um, white supremacist led violence this week. So uh, if you are looking to purchase a book, possibly from uh, one of our panelists today, uh, that's a great place to go. Um, but um, it's just one of the ways that maybe we can take um, the fight for black equality, black lives um, into actionable items and not just be signs uh, on our lawns and in our windows. Um, so I'm really happy to be uh, joined here today with um, two uh, people that are really associated with the Tin House uh, Workshop Program for a while, uh, Kimberly King Parsons and Mitchell S. Jackson. Um, Kimberly has been teaching with us this week as short fiction faculty, uh, and she actually um, once attended a Tin House Workshop, so it's really nice when those relationships come full circle from someone that participated to ends up teaching one of our classes. Uh, Kimberly is the author, of course, of the debut collection, Black Light, which was long listed for both the 2019 National Book Award and the 2019 Story Prize, and was a finalist for the 2020 Edmund White Award for debut fiction. Uh, joining uh, Kimberly is uh, Portland's own Mitchell S. Jackson. Uh, Mitch is the author of the novel, The Residue Years, and the memoir, Survival Math. And if I'm remembering my history correct, I believe uh, at least a portion of survival math or maybe the final um, portion of deciding on the cover was actually done while Mitch was staying at one of the Tin House apartments. Uh, so that's kind of a nice history that we have with Mitch. Uh, among many honors, he's been the recipient of the Ernest J. Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence and has received fellowships and awards from the New York Public Library's Coleman Center, the Landon Foundation and the Center for Fiction. And he currently teaches creative writing in the University of Chicago where he is joining us today. Uh, and as always, I want to thank uh, Mac, our uh, interpreter, um, for uh, being a part of um, the conference. Mitch and Kimberly, let's bring you uh, out. Happy to have you here. Hey. Hey, hey. Hi there. Um, <laughs> first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much to Lance and India um, for organizing this winter workshop, which has been such an incredible um, four, it's only four days, like it's been so amazing. Um, and to say thank you to Mac and I think maybe Selena might join us as an interpreter for this event. I'm so grateful to have this um, ASL interpreted. Um, and uh, so happy that you're here, Mitch. And thank you so much for coming and talking to me um, today. Yeah, I was so excited when you emailed me, yeah. Um, so I called this talk, Sound Like Yourself, um, which is from that Miles Davis quote that it takes a really long time to sound like yourself. Um, and I think that when I, especially when I was like starting out as a writer, that was one of the things I struggled the most with. Like, what does it mean to have a, a your voice or to say something the way that you would say it? Um, I think it applies to whatever art you're making, obviously, is to find your own way in. Um, yeah. But I think sounding like yourself is also just another way of talking about personal style, um, which 
I, I want to talk about how that relates to writing in a second. But before that, when I think of personal style, I think of you. And, and I don't just mean stylish among writers, which is not that lofty of a goal to be stylish among writers, <laughs> but, but I mean, in general, um, just such a, such personal style. Like if this were a late night show, we would have like a panel with all your outfits um, pop up right now with all these different outfits, but you're stylish, not only on the page, but also like at the events and at readings. And it's something that I know you think about. And so I just kind of wanted to start with that. Like what, what is your relationship to personal style? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I just was thinking about this, uh, I guess it was a profile a long time ago in this magazine called Flaunt. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, and I was making the case in the profile that personal style was like so connected to my writing that they were basically one, one in the same. And I, and I do think, um, I think it's a way of kind of delineating yourself in a space, both of them. And, uh, you know, one thing I think about also is like, you got to mess up so much before you actually get to what you can consider a, a, a personal style. I remember when I first moved to New York, I was like, there were, you know, you, 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 I lived in the village. So I was like always in Soho and I'd be in the village and, I, and everybody had like a different look wherever you went. So I would go back home to Portland. And one time I had like cowboy boots and a, a big buckle. And the other time I would have like the Adidas sweatsuit and I was, I guess, searching for what was what felt the most comfortable to me. Um, so yeah, so I, I took a lot of L's. Uh, I, I had some pointy toe pink shoes. I got in Soho. They were like bleached. I mean, it was it was some bad looks. Uh, but I but I settled, <laughs> you know, seven eight years later. And I think actually that 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 kind of searching searching while I was in New York kind of mirrors me trying to find a literary voice in the, the timeline of it. Yeah, well, and at the beginning with, like if we think about it from a style perspective, like you're trying to find your way in in the same way that when you're writing, you're copying other people or you're yeah. trying to emulate different styles to see what fits. So like we all sort of mirror those like, you know, parts of the canon that they forced on us in high school or whatever, because it's, it's sort of all across the board. But I was thinking, um, so my, I have a grandma who would like wear like glitter and like crazy stuff. And, um, and she also, she killed snakes. She would chop them in half with a, with a hoe. And then she would hang the, like the rattle, the rattler end up on a, on the stake on the wall. Like she was just a total badass. And she just wore stuff that was crazy. And it was very like glittery and nuts. But then later when I was first struck by like the idea of personal style, it was my dad would, was way into music and he would show me like the British invasion. It would be like, um, you know, the Beatles, but also like David Bowie and like um, mm -hmm. Roxy Music. And those guys are crazy. They look crazy, like the stuff that they're wearing. And it was so cool because I was like, my grandma would wear that jacket that David Bowie was wearing. Like she would like it. And there was some through line. But for me personally, like I'm a person who is sort of like afraid of clothes or I wish we didn't have bodies at all. So it's <laughs> tricky for me to think about how you, how like to announce yourself physically because it, it, puts attention on you, which can actually, and maybe this is some of it, it can be a little scary sometimes. Like if for like maybe for a woman, maybe for different people, but this idea of it draws attention to you right away. But I love what you said about you have to like try a lot of different things before you get to the right one, which, you know, yeah. some of those looks, some of those Bowie looks are working better than others too. <laughs> yeah. He was taking some L's for sure. I've seen <laughs> some of those old pictures. What you know, other thing I think about as well is like, you know how you can write a sentence and and kind of fall in love with it and, and like the syntax or the, the the acoustics of it it like it kind of gets away from you yeah. i think of that like connected to style too like you can get a bunch of different pieces that are all supposed to be right. you know stylish and then you put them all together and you just look like a hodgepodge of you know glitter uh yeah. whereas if you figure out the one piece that you need to anchor that thing then it becomes something that that's the thing you can direct people's attention to where it needs to be versus like just being too too loud. So I yeah. also feel like that works in sentences too. Yeah, because you're like looking at like you can wear those crazy boots, but you can't also wear the crazy hat at the same time. Yeah. You're gonna you're not gonna know where to look, right? Yeah. Well, I think it's cool because there's this sort of safety on the page too, a little bit. I mean, there isn't, there isn't, I guess, but um, this feeling of 
I could be louder on the page. I'm a reformed shy person. I'm not shy anymore, but, um, but I used to just be like much more comfortable observing and being quiet. So that meant also like dressing in a way that would be sort of like to obscure myself. But on the page you have, um, in my workshop this week, we've been talking a lot about attack sentences, that first sentence, yeah. attack and being like, the this is the moment this is your one shot and like annie dillard says the the feeling that you should hoard something or save it like that's your cue to spend it like mm. put it out there right away you know I like and, that. but it's neat because you you so you don't have time in fiction or in any writing to stand around and blend in with the scenery and then you know if you were at a party you might be like looking at someone and it takes you a while to walk up to them but you don't get yeah. that chance so you yeah. have to kind of come out showing them like this is what I want you to pay attention to my shoes or my hat or or whatever yeah you know I was reading rereading uh black light today <clears throat> and one of the things that uh I think I got this from Tom Spanbauer who's a, an or an Oregon legend but uh um uh, he talks about burying the eye uh in your in your attack sentence especially like not leading with an eye sentence and I yeah. went back to black light in none of your stories start with an I. And if someone were to go back and look at my published work, there isn't an essay or a story or a book that I've written that begins with an I, maybe since uh, before, before Residue was out. Um, and so I wanted to know what your relationship is to burying the I, and especially in, in, in attack sentences. I think it's that feeling of, um, you're already asking so much of, of your reader they're already opening up your book and they're already reading your stuff. So it almost seems rude to me, <laughs> even if we're talking about voice, like a character, but a character to be like, I did this. Like, it almost seems like rude. It's like, I, I already have the mic, right? And right. I don't need to show you that I have it by saying, let me tell you something. I'm just going to start to say it. I think there's something about, like, I feel like it's rude not to, um, or to, yeah. to just start with it, but also like, there's no space. You want to make more space for the reader to see yeah. So, so it's like, if I'm, it's, it becomes sort of myopic, I think, to start with the I. Um, but yeah, also like, this is just one of those basics. So Lish and I, uh, Lish and I, Mitch and I originally <laughs> met in the Lish workshop, which is sort of um, its whole, this whole other separate intense thing. But we were just talking before that was in 2008, um, the summer of 2008. And that was one of the rules, like there were many rules. <laughs> but one <laughs> of the rules was, um, I just remember that first day, we all stand up and read a sentence and my sentence was, I remember it, um, my sentence was, I am not in charge of us. That was my sentence, which I was like, all right. And he said, don't ever start with I, you never begin with I, like, how do you, how are you supposed to tell people that you have the mic? Like, you don't need to say I, they can see you basically, yeah. something like that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. The, the, I feel like, well, when you, do you remember the first time that you noticed style in writing form? Like, yeah. Um, the first time I wrote, okay, so I didn't, I don't remember reading until I was in my 20s. And uh, the first serious book, I know I've said this before, the ser first serious book I can remember reading was James Baldwin, uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And, you know, if you read Baldwin, he has like these really intricate sentences. He has this high diction, this high register that he's in. Um, he's very introspective, like he'll take one moment and kind of dilate and dilate and dilate. So really, and then at that moment, those were things that were either outside of my skill set or just not a part of my personhood and how I moved through the world or saw the world. And so when I was trying to emulate, because I didn't have another, I didn't have a lot of people. I guess one of the benefits of not being a reader is you don't have a lot of voices in your head, mm -hmm. right? So you're not really trying to emulate 10 people. You only really, I only had that one person, right. but because he was so far outside of my, my skill set, I could not even emulate James Baldwin. So it was like. I'm glad I can see you, Mac, because I know that it's not me that's frozen. It's the, <laughs> let's see, hopefully he will come back. Yeah, you're frozen too. Oh, good. Okay, you're, you're back. back. You're back. We're back. All right. <laughs> uh, I don't Sorry. know where. Where mm -hmm. I got stopped, but uh, if I froze as well, you did. So you, so you got to the point where you're talking about. So you didn't have a bunch of voices. You only had Baldwin, and you thought that yeah. was beyond what you could do. So yeah. it was better in a way. 
it was it was better in a sense that I didn't have other voices, but also it was uh, daunting because I could not do what Baldwin did. But it was also it also made me notice that this was a style that I could not approximate. Um, and so uh, I think the first time that I saw something that felt more organic to me and my experience was when I read um, John Edgar Wyman's short story, Wait. Uh, and that's when I was in my first year at, uh, at NYU's MFA program. Uh, and, and that was like some kind of, some language that I recognized that it really gave me kind of a, a license. Um, yeah, so I don't know who, who when did you first realize uh, your style? I mean, like on the page, I think, uh, it took me a much longer than it took you, but because I, I think I did have too many, I was like, a, I ended up having step siblings later, but I grew up an only child and I have parents who were like, find an activity. And so I spent a lot of time reading by myself, like as a means for, um, and being a shy kid, being sort of introverted in that way. So I had just a ton of voices in my head all the time to the point where I couldn't tell what was mine and what was theirs. And, um, and I still have that problem sometimes where you write a line and you're like, is that me? <laughs> is yeah. that somebody else? Um, but I think it took me, it took me longer to get to my own place on the page, but I was also a Faulkner scholar for two years or, or for like my graduate degree was I was going to write Faulkner criticism and that guy will get in your head and stay there. Like the sentences and the, and I don't write like that at all. Um, but it took me a long time to get out from under him. I think um, when I started to, to write on my own. Um, but I, you know, I feel like it was, it was something in, I think it goes back to this idea of consecution, which is what I've been talking with my students and the attack sentence is where the thing starts and then going backwards, going backwards, going backwards. So I think it was really like, I felt like I wrote a true sentence, whatever that means, um, mm -hmm. that was weird enough to sustain a story um, and that happened with you in that workshop, actually. Like it happened, you were in the room <laughs> when it happened. Um, yeah. Because I think before that, I was doing a lot of, a lot of like what I thought other people might want to read, um, yeah. which is the worst idea ever to try to change yourself to fit. I feel like what style is, is doing something differently than everybody does it yeah. and doing it over and over and over again. Like yeah. getting really good at it, right? Right, yeah. You know, like dialing it in. Yeah. Um, you know, since you brought up the class, I um, there's a moment in, I think the story is Guts, where uh, Sheila says, uh, this is how you make someone love you. You teach them something memorable about something boring, something they must do every day for the rest of their life. Uh, and that struck me because it, it felt to me like we were also talking about teaching in general and teaching writing, right? That you teach them something memorable about something boring, something they must do every day for the rest of their life. And if you're a writer, you basically should be writing every day for the rest of your life. Uh, and it, it made me think about being in that class with Gordon and, and what we developed for him was a kind of love. Um, and, and I wanted to know, uh, you know, he like gave you, I think, Oh, I'll speak for myself that I fell in love with him because I felt like he was giving me something that was underappreciated or underused about writing. Uh, so I, I wonder what was one of those things that you felt like you got maybe in that class or another classroom that was underused or underappreciated uh, about writing. Well, you know, it's, it's, I remember the night that you read your first line. This yeah. is such, it's so weird because this class is so intense um, and it's like what they would be these, it was, this was at the Center for Fiction, Noreen Tomasi set it up, she's wonderful. It was such yeah. a great opportunity. And it was this, you know, they would go on for six hours and yeah. nobody would go to the bathroom and you just sit there and you're supposed to just focus. And, and we would just listen to him talk. And that first night, I don't think we had to, talk, to, to read sentences the first night, maybe it was the second night, but we read sentences. And I remember when you read yours, um, and it's just like presence, you know, presence. And that's something that you have both on and off the page. This idea of like, when you come to the, to the, when you walk into a party, like I see you and I, because of the way that you move through the world and you had that same presence in that sentence. And it was like, I don't know what it is. Like it's, I mean, it's, the, it's magic. Like it's the thing that says, everybody listen up, like listen to this. And, and so I remember, but seeing other people find it 
in the room yeah. helped me to find it too. Because then you would hear something from somebody that was, you know, whatever, shot down for whatever reason <laughs> by Lish over the course of the night. Because if he doesn't like what you've said, then you're told to stop reading and you're done for the night. And then you, the goal is to come back, you know, with something better. And some people don't come back, of course, but, um, but I remember hearing people change and hearing people kind of get it. Um, and as much as I would think, oh, these are such restrictive rules. He was really, for me, for my aesthetic, Lish was never wrong. Like, right. You know what I mean? You could hear when people got it, but not only that, it's like the air in the room changed when people got it. Yeah. Like suddenly, and so something with that happened where I thought this isn't about, cause I used to be like, you know, from Texas, I didn't have necessary, I mean, I went to a state school, whatever, but I would, I was nervous about entering the world of writing. Like every, probably every writer is. And I felt insecure about what I had and hadn't read. Um, but for a teacher to say, you need to be dumb on the page. Like you need yeah. to be totally dumb, like forget everything that you know. And all you do is starting with one true attack sentence. And yeah. so I guess it was just trying to forget everything I had learned and my way through like literary criticism and all the other stuff. And just to say something that, that changed the, the feeling in the room. <laughs> like, but that yeah. also brings me, when you like, you're, you're such a phenomenal reader. Like when you read aloud, it's so, it's wonderful. And it's like, it's a different, it's a totally different experience than reading your work on the page. I mean, mm. it's the same words, but there's something about the way that you read them aloud. But how often are you thinking about acoustics when you're writing those sentences? Oh man, that's it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about, I was trying to, for myself, describe to myself what my, how I would describe my style. And I said, uh, I'm trying to show, let me see, what did I, I wrote it down here, let me see. Well, I think a lot of writers, are trying to show how smart they are, right? Or how proficient they are technically. Like they wanna astound you with like the architecture of their story or their essay. Um, but I, and this is also probably from some of my own kind of uh, insecurities about my, you know, relationship to reading and writing and education. But I'm not trying to show people how smart I am necessarily. I'm trying to show people how well I can hear mm -hmm. and how well I can make music and then the other thing I'm trying to show them is how malleable the language is to me. And then the last thing I think, if I had to put it in threes, the last thing I'm trying to show them is where and what I come from, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's a place, there's an experience, there's a, a, a sense of musicality and the sense of like this kind of malleable language, which to me is, a, is connected to where I came from because it is saying that the rules that apply to others don't necessarily apply to this experience, right? So it's almost kind of like an irreverence that I want to have for the language, but also a really deep love for it too. Like I'm trying to make something new, but also not trying to play by your rules. Right, well, there's like, I think there's also this sense when I read your work, even when what you're writing about is serious or heartbreaking or difficult to read, there's such exuberance at the level of the line. So mm -hmm. it's play it's playful and that's what i was trying to talk to my students about this week too this idea that writing is a game and you're setting out the rules at the beginning and then you're showing people how you play it and then you're either following through with the game or yeah. you're like swerve right which yeah. is a whole other thing but that's the thing is that even when i'm reading stuff that's so difficult to read from you there's mm -hmm. just so much play and joy frankly um even when you're writing about things that are not joyful um perhaps yeah. I'm like almost always writing about something that's not joyful. Right. <laughs> I don't think I've ever written about something joyful, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the case. I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's like, how do you write about um, like either it's whatever bad situations or dark characters, but then, but that's the thing is that I think the, the respect for language is always communicated. But then I love what you said about like, I am not going to play by your rules. Like I'm going to show you what I can, but then I'm going to change it. Um, yeah. So we, so when we met in this workshop, one of the things that um, like sort of the second part of this talk today about style is, so, you know, people need to have community and to create, you can't just do this by yourself. We spend so much time sitting alone right. in a room doing this. And so, um, so since 2008, you and I and a, and a, a small crew have met every month. Yeah. Um, rough, give or take, right? We've had a couple yeah. moments where we didn't, but every month uh, and we show work and we, meet and we 
critique and talk yeah. and and I I guess like I know what the group means for me <laughs> I want to know what it means for you um, and then um, maybe we can just talk a little more so the, for me the group is indispensable uh, you know I wrote the the most of like the revision of residue years while I was in that group I wrote all of survival math in that group and the moment that I signed a contract for my next novel, I probably emailed the whole group like, hey, now, I didn't even say nothing about the contract. Just like, hey, I think we, do we have some dates on, you know? Like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's going. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so it's essential to me because we have been in a group so long together that I also recognize what everyone's strengths are and what you're gonna get from people, right? So you also learn how to read the feedback from, from any given person in the group. Um, and I think we all bring, you know, probably, what is it, four or five of us maybe were in the list workshop. So we all have a kind of uh, chorus of aesthetic that we can draw from, but then we have people who aren't, who weren't list people, which I think is also good because they <laughs> see things in a way that we, we didn't see. Um, and I think we all respect each other too. Um, and you know, like, I remember seeing you get the 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 the, the National Book Award uh, nomination and just being like almost as ecstatic as if I was the one that had been nominated, right? So you also get to see people. It's so great to see something go from a germ to like the world embracing it, right? And and to me that shows the like the longevity of this too, and like the commitment that we all have to seeing each other uh, do well. So it, I mean, it's, to me, it's like being on a team for a really long time, you know, and you never have to retire. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I, I remember like yelping when I saw your public, like, like screaming when I saw your announcement because I was so excited, but also just like to follow people, the trajectory of people's careers and to see yeah. that in our group, it's people who, and I, I love having new people too, this yeah. who weren't in the list group, because I feel like sometimes, you know, that's the one thing you can learn one method and it can work for you really well. Yeah. Um, and then you forget that not everybody's reading with that in mind with those rules so yeah. not everybody um but so it's nice to have somebody else who's like what are y'all talking about like yeah. um and, but I love that and I also love even though like we when I lived in New York which we haven't lived in the same place in a while but when I lived in New York we would go to the bar afterwards or we would hang right. out but I liked that it was really mainly about writing like yeah. you know and that makes me more likely to follow through on turning things in on time yeah. <laughs> because if you're my friend if you're my best friend and we're just hanging out then I can be like eh. but there's this yeah. the group requires its own respect and reverence that's sort of outside of all of us and our own yeah. relationships with each other and yeah. so that's something and I'm saying this as a person who literally has not shown y'all anything and really <laughs> yeah. <at> it. Yeah. <laughs> um I was just saying I was like oh I have a whole book done I haven't shown them shit but I, I will I will I just haven't I you know but that's the thing too is I also know when I go back through my book I can tell like oh Mitch helped me with this line that's a yeah. Carrie, Cooper, Carrie Cooper writer did that like yeah. I can see the things that people helped me do um and I don't forget it you know ever yeah. um but I think that that's something about you know the people who are meeting at Tin House this week during this pandemic where it's much even perhaps more difficult to connect with other writers um I guess it's just you know finding your reader becomes really critical but also I was telling them it's good to find one person who is going to just champion you and then one person who's going to call you out on all the bs that you hoped that you were getting away with and I feel like there's a really cool balance in our Absolutely. I mean, do you remember me and Rob arguing about footnotes and endnotes? Or I mean, we have arguments about like semicolons versus colons, like 20 minute arguments. We're shouting. <laughs> yeah. so you I have a, that kind of workshop. <laughs> there's a picture at Tresco's house that that um, Diana took. And it's, yeah. it's me like looking at you guys and you guys are yelling <laughs> over my head. But yeah, like, because we get into it. And because it's also like, because it matters. Yeah. You know? And something that um, Rob Todd, who's in our group said, you know, um, I was saying it's hard sometimes to remember why this stuff matters. Like why, why does a semicolon matter or not? And he's like, well, yeah. if that if that doesn't, if that one thing doesn't matter, then like nothing matters, you know, like you have to fight the whole way through. Um, but yeah, that's, I feel like our group has been, I just, the advice I would give to any writer at any, whatever phase uh, in your writing is just to find a group of people who are both like you and not like you. Yeah. Uh, 
so that you can have them be a voice well, in your Also, too, I think, um, don't believe what the world tells you. Because, uh, you know, I've heard about uh, writers much further along in their career who refuse edits, who refuse oh, right. editor. Um, and I think that, you know, we've had enough success in our group where somebody could have got a, a big head pretty early <laughs> and like, I'm, I'm dropping out like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good. I got a National Book Award nomination. Like, what do I need you all for? Um, so I think that that, you know, humility is a is a great thing. And also to know that every new thing, like it almost doesn't matter what you did before. Like I'm more maybe more fearful about writing this novel that I have right now than I was about writing residue or survival, right? So, and, and I think having the, the comfort of knowing that there are people who have made this journey with me before is invaluable, right? Even if you all never give me feedback, it's just like, I know that I can get to a finish line with these group of people. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Well, and it's also just, I think it's, it's like careful readers and you know, you're going to have careful, yeah. you're going to have a careful reader in your agent and your editor, because that's their job. <laughs> 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 that's her job and that's but 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 you know outside of that it becomes very scary to think that the only thing separating you and the goodreads people is uh um, <laughs> you know you gotta get a buffer in there of a crew of people so that you're not blindsided um yeah, yeah for sure i i wanted to i think i wonder when we should do q a is lance gonna tell me if it's time to do q &A? Man, it's in the chat man so we we know we'll be over here talking for hours <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we still have plenty of time for for if you we can throw it to Q and A now, or you can okay. riff for a couple more minutes. Well, maybe we'll I, like. I have, I have oh, another question. Uh, let me see here. So I was thinking about your sentences, right? So I was reading. I was trying to define your style, and one of the things that I think is like, you never waste a word. Like, it's like a. Uh, you know, where I, like I see like, oh, you, you could have went one more word, but like that would have, it would have just pushed it over the line, uh, which makes me think about like philosophies on the page. Um, so I wonder what are some of the philosophies that are guiding you in your sentence making? Like if you, if you gave like, what are three like of the top philosophies or the most important philosophies that are guiding you? I don't know if I have three, but I have, <laughs> I have this, just one, which is like, I think there's there's this, I wanna talk about um, in a second with you because I feel like you have a different approach to this, but there's this idea of, um, I think I'm trying to charm the reader in as short of time as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's the same impulse that says, I don't wanna take up too much space in this room, right? Yeah. So it's like, let me really quickly come make you love me and then I'm gonna leave <laughs> like before I, <laughs> before I screw it up, right? Um, so, you, so, so my goal is to be as like almost, smaller um or to do it in a it's not that you're not like attacking you're still attacking but it's yeah. in a shorter amount of space yeah. um and i think that what you do is it's it's the same thing because the attack is, is so strong it's just that what you do i think is you take a sentence and it flies off like yeah. you can go around and but i love but that it's that it's that sort of looping fully encompassing and also it's like this is a sentence full of history and time and families and tradition and then it comes back at the end and it does that same punch it's just that i think for whatever you know maybe that's the personal style part it's like say it as fast as I can and then like leave the room versus like, hey, everybody look at my belt buckle or, you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, it's strange is, I know this, it might sound hard to believe, but like, I actually don't like that much attention. It's yeah. to the point where if <laughs> someone asks me to give a lecture, like they'll say like, okay, you got an hour, we need you to do an hour. And in my head, I'm like, you better not go an hour and five because like these people don't want and these people are paying me to come so I'm like <laughs> don't go an hour and five minutes because they don't want to hear you talking this long man or if I'm in a conversation and I'm the interlocutor you know how some people like they make every question about themselves before yeah, they oh, yeah. ask the question like I never do that because I don't want to take up that space I guess it's a little more freeing on the page um but one thing I think about that probably makes my sentences maybe uh longer than most people's sentences is I always have the rule of threes in my head. So I'll seldom stop short with like two clauses. I right, always right. push it to three. And the other thing is 
I love asides, right? So this is the thing that drives Rob Top crazy. Like I love, <laughs> you know, uh, apposition. Mm -hmm. uh, I love a parenthetical. Um, so, and it, I guess maybe it's because it kind of mimics how I think as well, but I think those two things are what make my sentences kind of go long. And sometimes I'm just like, how far can I run? You know, right. this used to say, go one breath more. Yeah. Um, so, so, so some of that is just me saying, can I go one breath more than the other person would go? Yeah. Well, and it's, that's the thing is like the effect of reading that it doesn't read by the way, like this person is hogging the mic. It reads <laughs> like everybody else shut up, like stop. Mm -hmm. Like it reads like, listen, and that's the thing. It's not about, because there's still for what my kind of joke about like, oh, I don't want to, um, it's rude to start with I, but this idea of, um, you're not like commanding the room in a way that's showy. It's like, I have a lot to say. That's what it is, you know? And it's like, and it's usually it's like this character has a lot to tell you, yeah. right? So it's never about the ego. I think that's the big thing too, is fully divorcing as much as we can in writing the ego from the work. Uh, when you're in the page, in the space of the page, off the page is, it becomes tricky, especially in the realm of social media and, um, yeah. You know, you're like, I want people to read my book. And so I guess I have to do these things, you know, I want, I have to be in this forum. Um, but I think on the page ev with every single story or the beginning of every book, you start over, you start yeah. fully over. And so you have to win people over again. And that's why you have to, to be um, either quick or thorough or whatever it is you're going to do. You got to do it from the beginning and keep doing it. Yeah. Seduce them. Yeah. Um, I want to say something that I think was very helpful. Maybe the most important thing that Lish told me, this is, I'm gonna tell you my sentence because I remember it as well in that class. It was, she told me to hold it for safekeep. He said, go on, mm -hmm. man. I was like, ooh, ooh, I got one sentence. I said, she told me to hold it for safekeep and then she took it back. He said, yes, yes. And then I said, rent money from under the mattress. And he said, stop. He said, mm -hmm. Mitchell, he said, uh, don't you ever ask for anyone's sympathy on the page. Don't ever do that. And the second thing he said to me was, you got an ear. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, the first thing, not asking for sympathy, I think is so important, especially to me and my content and people who are writing about traumatic events is that people think that the, that the, the ethos is in the trauma, right? Um, and you know, there are sure other stories that we could tell about people who were in that, but like, I don't necessarily think that just because something traumatic has happened in my life, that that gives me the utmost ethos. So that real, and also like, don't use that to kind of coerce the reader's sympathy. Um, right, you don't need a it. crucial lesson. Yeah, you don't need it. You don't need it because you can get it in other ways. Well, yeah, also, yeah I think that's, I think um, I just read this, somebody was talking about, oh, I think it was Joy Williams, some little Joy Williams piece about, oh, people talk about writers having a wound. And, yeah. um, and she's like, of course they have wounds. Cause I, like, we all have wounds. Every yeah. single person has a wound. And it's like, it's you write into it, but you turn it into this other thing entirely because, and also I think just to plainly state things to, to realize that your reader can follow you down tracks before you have to tell them about yeah. the rent money or whatever, you know, like the, the transmission of information can wait because before I get to that stuff, let me just, let me just explain what the game is. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. Are we now to, how do we know Lance when there okay. are <laughs> down there in the, in the box? It says Q oh. day. Oh, I do see one. Okay, cool. We got one. Let's be thinking about this. What role has reading out loud or orality in general played in the cultivation of your personal writing styles? Um, so we kind of touched on this acoustics. Uh, I in my class this week we've been talking about um, ac acoustic consecution, um, which my joke is that the words acoustic consecution rely on the rules of acoustic consecution. <laughs> because, um, but, but yeah, it, it for me uh, it plays a huge role. I know um, just in, even in this class talking about this class standing up and reading out loud. Um, has been really important, but Mitch, what about you? I mean, I know already, but. Yeah, I mean, it's everything. My, my rule, I guess the one rule I have is if it doesn't work in the air, then it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so that demands that you read it aloud, even though, you know, sometimes you get lazy, you hear it in your head a few times and you think you got it, but there is really no measure like reading it aloud. Like 
I remember reading Survival Math, the, the audio book, and asking myself, why did you complicate the syntax on this sentence so much? Like, I wish I would have read this one over maybe four or five times. I would have took a little something off of it. But yeah, I just don't think that you can approximate it by reading it in your head. I think that the, the acoustics of the sentence will give you a truth that that's the only way you're going to obtain it. For sure. Yeah, well, I think also like if you're, um, so I have two little children who only have beat on the door twice since we've been talking about <laughs> um, But so because of them, I can't, I can't always write when I want to write. And I find that I think of lines in my head when I'm away from, like far away from the computer. And so it's about trying to say something over and over in my head so I remember it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like, like a poem or like a song where you're just trying to get the beats so you know this has this many syllables and this many syllables. And um, so it, it becomes like, just to keep it, just to hold on to it, I would r rely on that stuff. Um, but yeah, I feel like what you said about reading, I, I find that in the moment, like right before you start reading a piece out loud in a room for a reading, you see all the stuff that's wrong or like, yeah. you know, like as <laughs> you get to it, you're like, and so then you can change it. You can change it in, in the air. Yeah. And it's so weird because you sat there before and practiced and it wasn't the case. And right. that, that pressure or intensity of having listening ears like changes the way you view the work. And I think um, it's the same thing in that list room because he wanted us to, he never asked us to turn anything in. Nobody's, it's not a traditional workshop where you hand out the pages and everyone looks at them. You're just saying it in the room in that moment. Yeah. And we could all hear it when it worked. Right. And when it didn't, you know, you could hear it. Um, even when, when it didn't and it was coming out of your mouth, you know, you could hear it. Um, <laughs> but I feel like that moment of right before you're reading or while you're reading, you kind of can sometimes fix things and then you just hope you can remember them later to like change them for real. Um, okay, we have another question. This is from my student, Megan, who's wonderful. Um, so she says, thank you both. I'm curious to hear how you both approach maintaining your writing style voice when tackling longer projects whether they be longer stories or novels in progress. So I'll ask you about that first. You know a lot more about writing longer things than I do. Um, well, I think you, well, first you would have to understand what your writing style is. And I think the reason why I asked about principles is I think that writing style cannot exist without understanding the principles which are driving you to those certain stylistic choices, right? So. So me valuing what people would call a dialect and wanting it to be a language is a part of my writing style, right? But that also comes from me wanting people to value my experience or black life. So I think you gotta understand that because you're gonna be, people are gonna test you. Um, I remember writing my first review for the uh, New York Times book review and I turned it in and you know, you're like you're, you're giddy and uh, they sent it back to me and they had taken out the one line where I thought like, oh no, that's my voice. And I remember emailing the editor back and I said, you can't take that line out because if you take this line out, anybody could have wrote this review. It's not me anymore. And he let it stay. Nice. And I was like, oh shit, like you can fight for these things. <laughs> you know, it's like a neophyte, you can fight for these things. So I think uh, understanding it and then, you know, being able to fight for it. And then the other thing is it's, it's always kind of changing, right? Like, so you're always trying to dial it in depending on what the project is, right? So it's it's different in fiction. Right now I'm writing in the third person voice, which I haven't done for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. So that's a different kind of voice than my regular kind of bag of aesthetics for, for a first person voice. But it's interesting to, to, to figure out what that is and to kind of, what are the rules, right? Like what, what rules am I playing with now in this new voice? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's fun. I don't know, was it different writing the novel from Choice Stories? I mean, I'm still writing it, man. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's technically, it's like technically done-ish, yeah. but um, yeah, it's harder. I think it's some of the things I love so much about short fiction is how potent the line can be. Um, and all of the things that I, that I love and that I think of as my style, a lot of them are tied to the form of short story, you know, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. And so it's tricky to then say, can you really ride this particular uh, voice for 250 pages? Like you could do it for 20 pages, but ca can you keep people along? Um, and so it's, it's trickier, but um, I think, yeah, with, with longer projects in general, I think it's like you're coming to it every day um, and that can change. 
it's like you, your voice is changing every day kind of as you get further into the project or you're not the same writer writing a book at, at year five as you were at year one and right. I think the short stories they can sort of capture this moment in time like when I go back and read my book I mean, I'm sure every writer when you read your book you think of stuff like you were just saying you're like why didn't I change this one clause like there are stories there's no way I would write that story now like as a like a 40 year old person like or whatever you know like because I wrote them so long ago and so it's and just but I'm also really grateful that they exist in the same way that I don't regret like my tattoo, like whatever, like it's just, it marks a moment in time. Um, yeah. But I think that, you know, your writing style does change as well over time. Um, and you said something that was interesting about how your, this new book is even in some ways harder for you than yeah. writing the other one. Like, why do you think that is like expectations or? Well, uh, yeah, I think a little bit about it is expectations, but it's also like I have been writing, you know, I write so much nonfiction, it's all first person. Residue is all first person. So, I mean, to move into third person is really a kind of philosophical leap for me, because, you know, if you believe Lish, like it's, it's false, right? So I had to get over that um, and then had to figure out well, what does this voice, what does this voice sound like? And, you know, I know what I, I feel like I have an understanding of some of the things that I do well on the page, but they work better in first person than they do in third. So it's, it's also figuring out, well, which, which, which ones can I use in, in, in both voices? Yeah, and then there's this, you know, niggling feeling that I'm gonna mess this up. Like, why didn't you just write this in, you know, multiple first person voices? It would have been a lot easier. Uh, but I think I would have had that that kind of niggling feeling no matter what, no matter what. I chose. Yeah, yeah, and you're I guess you're always like you want to challenge yourself. You don't want to just do the same stuff that you can do well over and over yeah. again because um in the same way, I mean I know there was like when I was doing this selling blacklight, there was talk of like, do I want to do a two book deal or do I want to say no, just do short stories? And yeah. there have been plenty of times where I've wished that I just said, just do short <laughs> stories. But I also know that I'm I like, I want to push myself in that way and, and see if I can do it and do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and then also, yeah, the same thing where you're trying to strike that balance between like, what is extremely my stuff, which is for me, first person, present tense. Yeah. And then what is, you know, a thing that I should work on, you know, or what, right. what should I maybe get better at? Um, and that's why also like negative feedback and positive feedback, not from like a writing group, but from like the world, I think both of them can be damaging because the yeah. positive feedback can then make you say, as you're writing the next thing, like, oh, but am I doing all the things that they like me for? Or am I, you know, you have now that voice in your head on top of your own stuff. And it's nice to just try to tune all of that stuff out. Um, so, okay, here's another question um, from April, also a wonderful person in my workshop. Um, can you talk about what stages of your work you share with a community writing group? And do you have rules around sharing early work versus later drafts? So you can go first. <laughs> um, I think that I have the bad habit of sharing stuff too early. Uh, I don't think that's true. Um, I, uh, I just, especially in our writers group, like I just feel, I feel comfortable sharing stuff in pretty early stages. And I also feel confident that there's going to be significant revision no matter what. So, and I think also the members of the group understand that what they see from me on a first go is probably not much like what it's going to look, uh, you know, in in the in a, in a manuscript, final manuscript form. So I I feel good about that. But then you also don't want to waste anybody's time, right? So uh, there's like a you got to find the, the the sweet spot between like feeling you've done something that you're you're not quite sure about, but you feel confident about parts of it, and then also that you don't turn in something that you think is bulletproof because. Well, if you think it's bulletproof, like, why are you sharing it, right. one? But then also when you get the feedback, because nothing is bulletproof, it could really tear your confidence down too, right? Like you turned in the thing you thought was like ready for the Paris review. And then you got all these notes back. And you're like, oh, I guess I don't understand my work in the way that I thought I did. So I think you have to, you have to give them something that you, that you feel is strong, but not perfect. Uh, and depending on how much you trust them, is the stage like I don't I wouldn't start a workshop and give someone someone the stuff like the early drafts that I, I gave you all of John of Watts like I probably would not share that with a new writing group it would be much later in it 
in the process? Yeah, I think um, it's, I want to be braver about sharing newer stuff. It's just that I feel like right now with this new thing, only my agent has seen it. That's it in the whole world. <laughs> like wow. even, you know, and, and I, but I also, because I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> and I wanted her to tell me what I was doing and I needed her help before. And I needed to then um, solidify things before I show it to someone else because it's so malleable that I didn't, like I needed to try to figure out the true like vision or purpose or whatever that was. And for me, the way to do that is to write it through. And if we're talking about a short story, like I think with short stories, I would show you guys rougher stuff. It would just be whatever. But with the novel, it's trickier because um, for one thing, workshopping a novel is so hard anyway, like just, you know, getting it in pieces. But I didn't want to show you guys anything yet because um, I because I just didn't know what it was yet or you know I wasn't 100% sure of how I wanted it to go so I had to show it to her because she made me um and then she had all of this really <laughs> wonderful feedback that's so helpful which was basically her saying like decide what you're doing because the process of a novel is just I mean the process of writing at all is just making decisions and narrowing stuff down right um and I think when I'm at that place at the beginning I haven't made all the decisions that I need to make but only I can make them like nobody else can make them for me and so you worry about being in a room where suddenly I'm like well I respect all these people tremendously so yeah. I want to just do what they say <laughs> and yeah. without you know without finding the real like kernel of the story um yeah but that's a lot of trust in your agent for that's a good agent right there. She's a good one. I love oh. my agent too, but ooh, I don't know if she'd be the only one I showed. <laughs> she is in the, she is in it with me. I can't tell you how grateful I am for her. And also she has this amazing ability. She's such a great reader, but she has this amazing ability to see the draft, like three drafts beyond what I've given her. Like mm. bless her heart. She can see through the mess of what I'm handing her, what it's supposed to be. And then she just asks the right questions, you know, which is all we can ask from these people. Like just ask us the right things so that you can send us down the path. Cause they can't do it for you. As right. great as your agent is, they can't write it for you. Like no one can write it for you. And that's the thing about this job. It's like parenthood. Nobody, you can't tap out and let somebody else do it. Like they're not going right. to do it the way you would have done it as much as you wish sometimes that you could, you yeah. know, you can only it's it's only up to you um let's see i'm looking at one more question what or maybe more i'm gonna do one do this one and then we'll see uh what are questions you ask of your own work before going into your writing group um so i'll let you ask that one answer that one first what are questions you ask of your own work um i think i ask um does this sound like me um i ask I myself that. um are there sentences in this piece of writing that I love? Uh, if there aren't, then I'm definitely not handing it in. Um, and then I kind of ask myself, like, what am I worried about? Like some people in our workshop send a manuscript and they'll send the questions that they have. Like, is this working or is that working or is this? I don't usually do that because I want like a kind of holistic feedback. Uh, every once in a while, I'll be like, look, I'm trying to work this particular thing out. Can you can you help me with this? Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, it really is sentences. Uh, and it's like not a good way to build a novel because you can't really build a novel just saying, I just want some nice sentences. But I, I know it. Yeah. <laughs> really just want some nice, like if I could build a novel and just, I remember when I wrote uh, Residue Years, my goal was like, I just want every sentence to be beautiful. Like it doesn't have to be fancy, but like every sentence has some kind of acoustical or aesthetic resonance or value. And if I did that, like everything else was icing. Like if it had a story, if it had a plot or a narrative, I was like, that's cool too. But <laughs> I just want a collection of beautiful sentences. Yeah. Do not, if you're out there, write your novel with a collection of beautiful sentences. I don't think it's gonna work out, but that this this is my goal. Uh, and it's still the <laughs> same goal for John of Watts. Don't tell FSG. <laughs> I feel scared. I feel scared. You scared me. No, <laughs> it's true. I mean, I think there's this feeling of, um, or at the very least, it's like, if I can do the sentences well, then maybe those other things will. Yeah, work themselves work out. out. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope. But I love, in our group, I feel like I, I remember 
just from my experience in my MFA, if I would ask people in the notes like that you send the, their submission with, like, mm -hmm. hey, what do you guys think about the ending? Suddenly everybody says, this ending isn't good <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> right? Like all of the focus goes to that one thing. Whereas yeah. if I just gave it to them, they might might or might not. And so I didn't want to drive the, con I don't ever want to drive the conversation too much unless I really am just thinking to myself, what about the ending? And then I feel like it's okay to just ask. Um, but yeah, I think the the idea of like, I write a lot by what I would say is gut feeling or like gut instinct, yeah. but that's really just another way of saying, I write what I like, that's it. Yeah. Like, it's not like a big mystery. It's not like my gut is different than your gut is her. You know what I mean? It's just, this is what moves me for whatever reason. And so, yeah, if somebody, you know, when you're taking notes of, in workshop or when you're, we're discussing things and one person says something that strikes a chord with you and you're like this makes perfect sense with what i'm trying to do you're writing down like oh, i'm going to change this and somebody else has a suggestion and you're like absolutely not <laughs> you <Yeah. know? laughs> right. but, but you just move forward and i yeah. think the main thing that drives all of it is just taste i mean it's just what you like and that's it and that's why I, in my workshop i was telling them pay attention in, but not just pay attention pay attention to what you pay attention to right, right. so if everybody in the class wants you to do some epistolary thing and you're like I don't want to do that don't do it just don't right. do it um because as you know and I feel very bad for you that you've had to read many chapters of my elephant novel um, <laughs> I love that novel <laughs> I tried to write a historical fiction about an elephant trainer I don't I elephants are fine but this is not the book that I'm supposed to write like talking about I want to write a book that only I can write yeah. right and this was like this historical fiction, Coney Island, because I think Coney Island is cool. I'm from Texas, you know? <laughs> like, I can't try. I was trying so hard to do the thing that I felt might be commercial or something. Um, and it, it just wasn't, it ended up not being me. And leaving that book behind was the best decision because I just, I was like, if nobody's going to read these weird short stories, that's totally fine. But this is what I want to do. Um, and you just do it like you would be doing it, whether anyone was watching or waiting for it anyway. Because yeah. it's your only, this is your chance. This is your only life, you know? Um, <laughs> so are we, I wonder if we, do we have any other questions? If you have well, we can make this the last, uh, the last question. Okay, I'll read it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how your style has shifted, is shifting? You go. Style shifted. Uh, I think, um, okay, so I remember um, when we were in the workshop and Lish told me that I had an ear, like everything was like, you know, the anaphora, the alliteration, the, it was like on one million. Uh, I don't remember, know if you remember this story I had called Head Down Palm yes, Up. Yes, of course. Uh, I wish I remember the, the opening of that story. It's like, uh, damn, I wish I remember the opening. It was like, Hey, no, it's it hard to see Unc in the shade with his being the same shade as the shade, but you can always depend to track his gold tooth, a glinting last to last extravagant. There you go. Oh no. I think we lost him. And at the worst time, because that's so beautiful. <laughs> Hold on, let's see. That was so beautiful. It just froze. I know. <laughs> it froze everything. You just broke the internet with your beauty. Is everyone else still out there? I'm here. Are people there? Oh, my job. I think they're here. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, at least we know. I, I love, yes, this is Selena. Hello, Selena. Um, she's telling us, so I can tell at least that we are, we are still working. Oh, here he is. I'm back. Yeah. We lost you right at the end of that beautiful line, and we were joking that you broke the internet with your beauty. <laughs> uh i don't know where okay so the last part of the line was a glinting yeah. last to last extravagance and i was just saying how that that sentence was so complicated the syntax the acoustics um and that was one thing because lish had told me that was my strength i was uh you, you know it was like hyperbolic and i think the thing that I, has changed about my style sometimes is that i have learned to temper that Right. Um, because you can't have all sentences like that, right? No one, you know, you won't be able to notice them. Um, so yeah, so learning, you know, when to turn on your superpower or your power and then when to like walk around as, you know, Clark Kent. Yeah, when to wear the boots 
and when to yeah. wear the hat or whatever, yeah. right? Like, yeah, not both not the the hat and the, boot <laughs> and the belt, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think maybe the same sort of thing. Like, I feel like when I first started out, I was so excited about, um, about like the possibilities of like the syntactical possibilities of fiction that I got real excited about using all sorts of um, sort of acoustical consecution and like yeah. getting really excited about s numbers of syllables and all the yeah. stuff nobody would ever notice but me. Um, and then now, you know, especially for a novel where you realize you have to, you really do have to move people around and have somebody open a door and walk down a hall yeah. or whatever, you know, like you can't just have a, a space break for everyone. Nobody's moving, you know, people have to move. Um, and so that's changed and like getting a little looser and freer and like um, not quite as, yeah, just not quite as mannered maybe, you know? So, yeah. Oh, this is so fun. This is awesome. And I always love talking to you and I always love seeing you and um, thank you so much for joining and I mean, yeah, this is great. Ten, and, and Lance, you were right. I did write those survival files in the Ten House uh, apartment, man. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm always thankful to y'all. Don't ask for no royalties because there ain't none, but uh, <laughs> I love y'all. <laughs> All right. Well, I can't wait for the, the next time. Maybe you can stay there and, and finish the next the next piece. So uh, Kimberly, Mitch, thank you so much. Uh, Selena and Mac, our interpreters, thanks again for, for being here this weekend with us. Uh, and uh, both Mitch and Kimberly, Selena, Mac, everyone stay safe. Everyone watching on YouTube, have a lovely rest of your day. And uh, for those of you participating in the workshop, we'll see you in about uh, 20 minutes for our next lecture. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you.